want to welcome everybody today to our webinar, 2020 Lessons Learned, Captive Insurance and What the Future Likely Holds for Middle Market Companies. I'll be your host, Randy Sadler. I'm a principal here at CIC Services. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Christopher Gallo, who I'll introduce. He is uh, a managing director at CIC Services, uh, focusing on operations and in, uh, and in new alternative risk transfer programs. He comes to us from the Connecticut Department of Insurance, uh, where he uh, worked for 35 years, uh, and his last time there was in captives. So he has uh, tremendous experience, and we're thrilled to have him on our team. Uh, so you're going to really get a, a regulator's perspective today, uh, which I think is is very exciting as well. Okay, Thank you I would for that introduction. Yes, absolutely. And so. Uh, I would ask if you could keep your computers and phones on mute, on mute unless you're asking a question. And then uh, feel free to type your questions in the chat bar or we'll have some times when we pause and you can just unmute uh, and, and ask away. All right, very good. So this is our team at CIC Services. We are a captive manager, which means that we help businesses set up and own their own insurance company. Uh, we are located in Knoxville, Tennessee, and you can see our smiling faces. If you ever come through here on I-40, I-75 or fly in, come see us. Uh, we would really like to hang out with you. Uh, this is Chris's bio. And uh, as I mentioned, Chris has uh, spent 35 years uh, in the Connecticut Department of Insurance, his last stint uh, working in captives. Uh, and so we're thrilled to have him join our team and you're going to get uh, a regulator's perspective. Very good. And then this is this is my bio. By the way, we'll be glad to send these slides to you. Slides to you. So, uh, I have been at CSE Services uh, nine years and worked in captive insurance nine years. I really learned my risk management uh, in the Army. I went to West Point, was a tank commander for five years, and uh, that's really where I cut my teeth in risk management, with tremendous focus on safety, uh, with ammunition, uh, fuel, uh, people, vehicles uh, moving over. Uh, lots of distances. So I always tell people that's really where I learned risk management. All right, and a little bit about our firm, just so you know about CIC Services, in case you're new. Uh, CIC Services is a captive insurance company manager. We help businesses own their own insurance company, which provides really a alternative risk transfer solution to help them protect the business. And there are many benefits of owning a captive, uh, and we'll cover many of those today. Uh, and really, they're extremely relevant to middle market businesses, and that's really what we'll be focusing on today in particular. And so, you know, the way to think about it is we help businesses, uh, you know, in the process of owning their own insurance company, first establish asset protected loss reserves, you know, money that's set away for, for losses, uh, be they uh, insurance losses, or if the company doesn't have an insurable claim, they can access that money via dividends, for example. Uh, we help them increase their total profit uh, and wealth generally by millions of dollars over time, uh, lower and control insurance costs uh, by having that captive in place. It really gives a really powerful negotiating tool with carriers. Uh, we also help ensure uninsured or underinsured risk. COVID-19, uh, the recent storm in Texas, for example, uh, where businesses might have been interrupted but not damaged, perhaps do, had property damage and the commercial insurance may not cover that. Uh, and then benefit from insurance company tax treatment. You know, all insurance companies receive favorable tax treatment. Uh, and if you own a captive, you're not alone. Uh, state Farm, all state, they're getting this, they're getting the same favorable tax treatment that allows insurance companies to build up loss reserves. Uh, what is a captive? Uh, a captive is a real insurance company. Uh, the only difference is that they have a limited license. So a captive can't simply uh, go out and insure, say your neighbors for their auto insurance. Your state will throw you in jail for that. Uh, however, you can insure uh, your business related entities uh, very often can insure things like warranties. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the definition of related stretches pretty far. Uh, captives have been around since the 1950s. Uh, if you do own a captive, you're going to get a license from somebody. Normally, it is, uh, in most cases, a U.S. state regulator. So Chris was in Connecticut, and he was the regulator there. And uh, Connecticut issues insurance licenses to captives. 
uh, so do many other domiciles, uh, we call them, like North Carolina, Tennessee, Delaware, Vermont, uh, many of our favorites. All right. And, and so, Chris, you know, we've talked about what a captive insurance company is. What do captives do? Excellent question, Randy. I tell people that risks are for, really broken down two categories. There are your core risks which are usually always covered by a commercial insurance company. And there's your non-core risks, which fall outside of the core risk. Or examples of core risks, like property insurance, general liability, workers' compensation, auto liability, umbrella, health insurance, all those risks, you always really, no entity wants, does not want to be not covered for those types of lines. And then on the other side, the non-core risks, couple of examples, there's probably about 20 or 25 of business interruption, which Randy talked about earlier, COVID-19. So COVID-19 caused tremendous business, business interruption, supply chain interruption. And those are the types of risks that we really, it's difficult to go out to the commercial market and say, hey, we want to protect ourselves against these types of pandemics. And that's where captives come in. Like I say, they both, you can ensure both core risks in, in the captive insurance company and the non-core risk and any combination thereof. Very good, very good. So this is a, you know, just a very typical captive insurance company structure. Uh, there's many ways to structure them, but in simple terms, the shareholders own the business uh, and they also own their captive and they pay premiums to their insurance company and transfer risk. It issues insurance policies back uh, and then they're able to profit both by the business, but also by the captive insurance company itself. Uh, and always, uh, very often, uh, in middle market spaces, we work with advisors uh, who advise businesses. Uh, some businesses really don't have a, a CFO or strategist, if you will, or a financial strategy. And so the captive creates assets under management as well. So uh, many financial advisors we work with not only help protect the business via captive, but they also manage those assets under management that accumulate in the captive. And so a captive has you know, many benefits, including a stronger business model, better risk management, um, improved cost control can be a big one, especially controlling commercial insurance costs, keeping insurance profits. Most captives are very hard for creditors to attach to, so they also provide a measure of asset protection. Uh, they do help the business accumulate wealth or retained earnings in, in the captive that can be accessed. Uh, they do re receive favorable tax treatment uh, like any insurance company does. So the really, really big benefits are more insurance and more money, if you will, the ability to insure a wider swath of risk, uh, but also retain the earnings in the captive. So let's dive into our discussion today. Uh, you know, 2020 was kind of a, a one in a hundred year pandemic, if you will. I think the last big pandemic <laughs> was the Spanish flu almost a hundred years ago, remarkably. Um, should middle market companies expect smooth sailing ahead? Chris, what do you think? Well, like you said, Randy, the pandemic, I'm 61 years of age and this is the first I've ever seen of something like this pandemic, but one needs not look too, bad, too far back. In the recent history, you see things that were extremely disruptive. You know, we had the 2008, 2009 Great Recession. Ask Lehman Brothers or AIG how they did because they were over leveraged. They had illiquid assets and poor cash flow. And you can hear me talk about that a lot. Uh, cash flow and liquidity. As a regulator, I, I realized that cash was king. So some people could have tremendous amount of assets and wealth, but if the assets aren't liquid, if you don't have a cash flow like AAB, you can collapse in one week, even though they were the largest property and casualty insurance company in the world. We also had the 2001 dot com bubble burst and the 9 11 terrorist attack. And um, I'm showing my age here because I was a regulator in Connecticut in the late 80s when that real estate price ended up uh, showing its head. And there was the largest life insurance company at the time. They had the largest life insurance company failure, Mutual Benefit Life. They had $3 billion of real estate on their financial statement. And then lo and behold, the real estate crisis came and that $3 billion was all of a sudden 
worth 1.5 billion. So they went from having 750 million of capital surplus to being 750 million dollars in the hole. So if history teaches anything, we know right around the bend, there may not be a pandemic, a COVID pandemic, but there's gonna be some tremendous challenges presented to the business industry. Yeah, and Chris, I always, always like to emphasize that for middle market companies, it's, it's rarely property damage that puts you out of business. It's, it's almost always an interruption in revenue or disruption of your business model. Uh, and so it's really important to ensure against those, those risks that are the ones that usually put you under. Absolutely, very good points. So, you know, what else could go wrong for middle market companies? I mean, Chris, you, you've alluded to some of the, uh, some of the crises in, in just the last, you know, 30 years. What else could go wrong for middle market companies? You know, uh, they call it COVID-19 for a reason because it's the 19th uh, version of this type of germ, I guess, of this virus. So who knows? There might be COVID-20, 21. We do not know. Will we ever get herd immunity? Uh, when will they op companies be open for business? We've got that international tension, the China trade war, and also... Again, we didn't have to look that far back, the civil political unrest in 20 and 21. I don't think that's going away. So I, I think these are potential black swan events of the future. Yeah, very good points. Uh, we've got a question already. How do we define middle market? So typically, you know, we think about middle market and, and there's a lot of different definitions of it, but typically it's a business between 5 million uh, and 500 million in revenue. So. Uh, that's our most common definition. Typically under $5 million, you have a little more of a small business, uh, kind of sole proprietorship style businesses. Uh, and then over 500 million, very often you're getting into publicly traded entities or, uh, you know, in some cases, just the ability to access larger markets, access more capital. Uh, and so that's, that's how we define it. Uh, certainly it's open to interpretation, but um, appreciate uh, your, your asking that question just so you have a sense of of our perspective on middle market. Randy, yeah. there's a couple others uh, that, uh, on the next slide about the black swan events. So the escalating costs, uh, insurance, a hard market is defined with 10 consecutive quarters of increasing rates. And we are in that hard market. So it's been like maybe we're in our 11th quarter of increasing insurance rates. Energy, uh, for example, the new administration stance on non-green energy. Uh, I know my gasoline prices have gone up. So when I pump my, put the gas in my car since, since uh, January. And, uh, and also we saw the blackout in Texas. That, that might be uh, an administration stance. Who knows how they're gonna address that? Who knows if that's gonna be a recurring theme going forward. Healthcare, that's an annual event. Every, everyone who knows who's the healthcare, whether it's a business or an individual, they see how those prices have escalated each and every year. Also, taxation between the mounting federal and state deficits, the stimulus plan costs. I remember reading an article recently where Governor Cuomo in New York was stating that he would need a $15 billion bailout from the federal government to just to balance New York's budget. And then uh, with legal also, We've seen a rise. We've talked with business owners, and they say there's been a, an increasing claim. They say when it's really bad out there, and with the pandemic caused a, a lot of suffering out there, they see there's an increase of claims filed, uh, and some not such uh, kind of on the fraudulent side of a claim being filed. But that's going to happen in, in stressful times. That's right. The more desperate people get, the the more the more likelihood there is of of looking for a way to make money, even if it's a illegitimate insurance claim or, or filing uh, uh, for, you know, a slip and fall or some type of, of, you know, fake injury even. So we definitely see those types of things as well. All right. So Chris, what, what lessons can we learn from the past? I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting here going into arguably the, the new roaring twenties, a hundred years from the past roaring twenties. Uh, what do we, what should we expect? So, the lessons learned from the past and what we, because what happens in the past, we may not be the same type of stress scenario, but we know stress scenarios are coming up in the future. And it offers businesses an opportunity to protect their future against a whole slew of stresses. I mentioned it earlier, and I'm always going to mention this, 
cash flow liquidity, the cash flow and liquidity strain. By forming a captive insurance company, you can protect yourself against that, that strain. And cash and liquidity are king. They're a critical component of successful, sustainable enterprises. I mentioned AIG. AIG was a tremendously successful company. And if it wasn't bailed out, it would have gone from the largest insurance company to bankruptcy. It was bailed, bailed out by the federal government. But they put themselves where they are highly leveraged. They had a lot of assets, but it was not liquid and they did not have the cash flow in the stress scenario to keep the enterprise going. We talked about the hard insurance market, the escalating premiums, reduced capacity for critical coverages. For example, we're, we're working with formation of an umbrella reinsurance captive where the person who's going to be forming this, he says the property owners are desperate. It's unbelievable how um, the umbrella premiums have skyrocketed in this past year alone. Uh, also, coverage for risks not offered in the commercial market. I mentioned earlier uh, those non core risks, supply chain interruption, business continuity, business interruption. Those are all very legitimate risks. And we just have to look back to 2020 to see how that impacted many, many businesses. Um, Unfavorable claim exclusion policy language. Ensure vandalism caused by writing and business interruption caused by government shutdown exemptions. So I remember reading recently, there was a, a store owner out in Portland, Oregon. They had their life savings in merchandise in the store. And they had, they had va uh, vandalism coverage and people broke in. They took all of their merchandise, but all of a sudden, lo and behold, Insurance company says, you know what, we have an exclusion if there's vandalism caused by rioting. So sorry, those, those people have to uh, apply for bankruptcy now because they had no insurance coverage, but they're paying the premiums. They thought they had it, but again, it was unfavorable policy language. And, and lastly, unforeseen catastrophic events. Um, like I said, if people think that we're all, all the catastrophic events are behind us, they don't have to worry about it. I don't think they're thinking wisely. Yeah, that's for sure. And uh, 2021, uh, in many ways, doesn't look any better than 2020. Uh, certainly the storm in Texas and uh, very, very uh, intense political tension in our country uh, continues. So I don't think the business is should expect it to be rosy, for sure. So you, you mentioned, you know, cash flow and liquidity strain, Chris. And, and so how can forming a captive, you know, protect middle market business owners against cash flow liquidity strain? You know, as well as my daughters, I always, always use the L word, leverage. Leverage is huge in every aspect of life. So how can a business owner get more leverage? By forming a captive, a captive insurance company, because they are an insurance company, they are allowed access to the more affordable wholesale insurance, which is the reinsurance world. That's where the commercial market goes to buy their insurance. So right now, when I go get my automobile insurance, I, I'm, I go to the retail market. But if I form my own insurance company, I can go to the reinsurance market, which is the wholesale market. Also, insurance companies, I tell people all the time, there's a reason why the Metropolitan Building in New York and the Prudential Building in Boston, so they're so massive and how these companies have billions of dollars. Because your well-run companies the underwriting profit inures, if you go to the commercial market, it inures to the commercial market's bottom line. But if you form your own insurance company, your own captive insurance company, and it's well managed and you put good risk mitigation strategies in place, that underwriting profit will inure to you, your bottom line, not the commercial carrier's bottom line. And due to what I just stated about the profit inuring to your bottom line, you will realize as a business owner, as we keep on improving our risk mitigation dramatically, it'll further bolster our underwriting profit. Real quick story, Hartford Hospital told me they have a captive that a patient came into the emergency room suffering of a stomach ailment. They took a chest cavity x-ray. They sent him home. 18 months later, he died of lung cancer. His estate successfully sued Hartford Hospital because in that chest cavity x-ray, it showed his lung mass. So they were proven liable. So going forward, Harper Hospital said they're captive. They said, you know what, from now on, whenever any patient comes into the emergency room, if we 
fix a broken toe, but we notice a lung mat, I mean, a last a mass on his ear, we're going to send a letter notifying the patient and the primary care physician that we noticed something else other than the problem that he came into the emergency room. So this way, they cannot be sued in the future for that type of event which happened with that gentleman with the lung cancer. So the risk mitigation improved, loss of continues going down, the profit inures to the captive owner's bottom line. Also, I talked about that cash is king, the underwriting profit increases retained earnings, also known as equity or surplus, which is also increases your cash flow and liquidity. Uh, captive asset investment options, you know, excess surplus is allowed to be invested strategically. Again, that Hartford Healthcare, the health, Hartford Healthcare captive, they took all their earnings from their captive and they built a birthing room so they had mannequins so that so the obstetricians can practice delivering babies. So their medical malpractice premiums kept on going, their losses kept on going down and down and Hartford Hospital's captive became more and more profitable. And lastly, the excess surplus is allowed to be paid in a tax-free transaction via a dividend to an upstream holding company. So again, the assets are oftentimes used by the business owner to expand his, his business, not just the capital, but also his business. So those are all ways how forming a captive insurance company can protect business owners against the cash flow and liquidity strain. Yeah, very good points. Uh, Chris, we've got a, a question we can we can tackle here. Um, this is from uh, Patrick. And it basically, what Patrick's challenge is, is getting carriers to give a big enough discount for the increased retention that the captive's taking. So you've got commercial insurance policy, and the captive's taking some of the risk, and, and the commercial carrier's not giving enough of a discount. Uh, that's the first part of the question. The second part of the question uh, that goes with that is, you know, the wholesale insurance market challenge right now is that they want to see five million in premium to even look your way. Uh, and so there's there's kind of a two part answer here, um, uh, Patrick, the, and and I'll be glad to speak with you more on a call. The good news is more and more carriers are kind of waking up and realizing they're going to have to work more with captives and they're going to have to reward those captives for participating in the risk. Uh, and so we're seeing. Uh, Carriers that are willing, for example, to write insurance, uh, you know, write basically first dollar coverage uh, on, on admitted rated paper, but then turn around and reinsure part of that risk to a captive. So instead of having a fronting and reinsurance arrangement, you have one carrier doing it all uh, and reinsuring part of the risk to a captive. That's a very powerful strategy. Uh, we've really helped companies uh, in many cases retain half their premiums. Uh, so I'd love to talk with you about that. Uh, and we've seen successes in everything from uh, car lots to construction. But again, uh, you know, it takes a carrier that's willing to do it. Uh, and so you got to work hard to identify those and then convince them that it's worth doing. Uh, and part of uh, what they want to see is how the captive is structured so they know that it's going to be there. So we can speak to that more offline, but it, it may be something that other uh, attendees today have a challenge with. And the other thing uh, that I would say is that the, this is the reason that a business needs to start a captive now. You know, very often companies uh, wait to the markets really hard, and then they start a captive, and then it's kind of, and now they're not in a they're not in a position of leverage, if you will, to negotiate. Right? Uh, if you start your captive, the earlier you start it, even if you're not taking a lot of risk, uh, and start building up funds, uh, the easier it is to negotiate uh, to take more of the risk. Uh, when that captive is stronger and been around longer. Uh, so I'd love to talk with you offline about it. We've got a few more uh, in the chat. So let's just tackle those right now. Let's see here. Okay, got it. Here's an email. Good, thank you. Okay, but it was someone else's inquiry. Okay, very good. Yeah, so thanks for sharing the email. Uh, we definitely look forward uh, to, to connecting with you. And hopefully that helped to kind of explain it. The thing, that, the thing to think about, you know, this is true in, in almost any industry in America, things always get smaller, if you will. And what I mean by that is used to be your cell phone was huge. Now we carry them in our pocket. Only the rich could have them, now everybody does. You're going to see insurance uh, carriers having to be more and more and more creative and work with smaller and smaller captives. I mean, you know, I always tell people, you know, a health savings account is probably the, one of the smallest captives on the planet. Uh, it, it, it isn't called a captive, but it, it functions like one. Uh, it provides insurance. 
it shares risk, uh, it has tax benefits uh, that every insurance company has. Uh, and so by participating in your health insurance cost, uh, you know, and by hopefully taking care of yourself and minimizing your claims, uh, you, you keep more of that HSA money and you keep um, your, your health insurance costs down, right? So that's a, think about that as a tiny captive, if you will. So there's always gonna be pressure to make captive solutions for smaller and smaller businesses. Randy? Yeah. Uh, I just wanna add another little point to your response to Patrick. And Patrick, mm -hmm. we hear you when you talk about that $5 million minimum that a reinsurer wants. But earlier in the slides, uh, Randy alluded to how we always try to place the captive in an appropriate domicile. Not only does CIC always go extensively beat the bushes of all the domiciles to figure out which is the best domicile for a particular business owner. We also beat the bushes when we go and we talk to brokers and they can no longer, the private sector, I mean, the commercial market can no longer just ignore the power of captives. So we have many brokers and reinsurers wanting to do business with us because maybe a captive may not be huge, maybe it doesn't have that $5 million, but because CIC represents many captives and in and, and totality, if you aggregate it all up, we're talking about $100 million sometimes that reinsurers are all of a sudden listening to us. And we've had some brokers tell us that some of these reinsurers now are interested in a million dollar premium business with a, with a captive. So again, that's what one of the services that CIC does. We go and negotiate on behalf of the captive owner and we work with brokers to find a reinsurer who's willing to partner with that captive who wants to ensure, uh, participate in the risk of his own business. Uh, we actually have uh, another question uh, that I'll, I'll uh, bring up here. It's uh, two part. Please discuss premium deductibility and then discuss capital to risk retention ratio. So uh, yes, when your business um, buys insurance from its captive, uh, that is normally tax deductible in the same way that, you, that buying insurance from you know, your, your carrier is. So when you're buying insurance, that is a deduction for the business. So that's, that's one of the huge advantages of owning a captive is, is the captive, uh, the business has a deduction and then the captive is taxed as an insurance company. So that's, that's a, that can be a huge win for a lot of businesses. And it's really there to make sure you can build up loss reserves for the future. I mean, when a business has a loss, the captive needs to be able to pay the claim. And then the capital to, to risk retention ratio, uh, typically in a captive, uh, you're gonna have an initial capital required by the regulator to be in the insurance business. And that's normally really paid one time up front when you form the captive. Uh, however, in fronted reinsured uh, programs with carriers, they're normally going to require, we usually see one and a half times uh, captive premiums in collateral. Uh, now that, that's money essentially that is, um, you know, the business owner still owns it or the company still owns it, but they do need to have that money uh, set aside as collateral. The good news is, and this is again why the earlier you start your captive, the better. As the captive builds up reserves, that collateral requirement comes down because the, the funds in the captive uh, are seen as uh, you know, being able to meet that collateral requirement. Okay, I hope that answers your question. I think that was Bob. And then Maybe. we've got one more Maybe. question. Yeah, far away. Just Chris. one other, one thing to add. So, you know, it's a, that's a critical point that Randy stated that in either case, if you pay the premium to the commercial market, you get the deduct it, tax deductible. And also if you pay it to your captive, you get to deduct it. But the difference is when you go to the commercial market, you're giving the commercial market the money to get the deduction. When you form your captive, you're paying the money to your fully owned business. So the money stays in the holding company system of the enterprise. And so you still get the write-off, even though you're paying it to a downstream captive. Yeah, very good point. And then one other question, Chris, <laughs> are you captive managers or is this a wholesale insurance placement play? Uh, we are captive managers. Uh, perhaps, I, I know I covered that early on, but you might've missed it. I think this Michael, but yes, we help businesses set up and own their own insurance company. We work with uh, property casualty insurance brokers, uh, helping them uh, solve their clients um, alternative risk transfer challenges. Uh, so I'd be honored to work with you. All right, let's keep going. So how does forming a captive insurance company protect business owners against a hard market? You know, I, I mentioned that 
it's obviously better to have formed your captive when the market wasn't hard because now you've got more uh, ability to negotiate. You can lean harder on your captive to take a portion of risk. But, but nevertheless, uh, we are in a hard market, as Chris mentioned, 10 quarters of increasing insurance costs. Uh, how can a captive help, Chris? So I talked about the L word, the leverage. So the increased retained earnings as a captive is well run. With risk mitigation strategies, it allows the captive to expand, providing their own coverage. So as the assets start to build up, if the market gets really hard and all, all of a sudden the commercial market says they want to increase their rates 100%, you might say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take that risk totally in house now. You've got the earnings, you've got the experience as time goes on. And also, as mentioned earlier, the increased retained earnings allow the captive to invest in risk mitigation strategies. I already talked about the Hartford Healthcare captive, uh, the mannequin birthing room where they had the mannequin showing the obstetricians how to deliver a baby. And also a one hospital did a study that they noticed that they use brass door handles in the hospital, it reduces germs being uh, passed on by like 98%. So by doing that, there was a study that was funded by the hospital captive. And now because they instituted, they changed all the doors to brass and all of a sudden the amount of germs that are passed or viruses from one patient to another has dramatically reduced, therefore lowering the hospital's losses and increasing the retained earnings in the captive. So those are examples because it starts to build up assets and with the assets, increase cash flow and liquidity, you have more power over your enterprise. Very good points. Okay, Oops. let's see if it'll let me advance the slides here. There we go. So Chris, how does forming a captive insurance company provide coverage for risks that aren't offered or poor policy language? I mean, you know, we, you know, as, I, as I flip through the news, I see that there's a lot of lawsuits right now uh, between businesses and the carriers who the carriers are following their policy language. The policy language says, uh, if your property wasn't damaged, your business interruption insurance doesn't trigger, right? Uh, and so, you know, when the government came in and said, close your restaurant, close your business, uh, you know, the insurance carriers arguing by the letter of the policy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would, I would contend they're arguing rightly that, that they're not on the hook for business interruption. But that policy language was there, uh, and they didn't underwrite or price the insurance to cover business interruption from a pandemic, for example. So um, there are a lot of risks that you know businesses might think they're insured for, but they really aren't. So how does a captive address that? Good question. And basically, a captive insurance company is the business owner's own private insurance company, which is allowed to cover its legitimate business risk. So if a, the commercial market does not provide coverage that a business owner needs, all the more reason to form his own private, also known as captive insurance company to cover those legitimate business risks. And we talked about or poor policy language. We talked about that Portland, Oregon riots where the people had their, all the merchandise stolen. So legitimate business construction claims were denied by the commercial markets because of the exclusionary language. So sometimes, uh, you know, people get their policies and you can look through it and they'll say, oh, we're not going to pay under this situation, this situation, or this situation. So the commercial market, they've done very well. They love to collect their premiums. They really don't like to pay the losses. So they, they try to cover themselves. And that's why if you form your own captive insurance company, so for example, that, that couple who had that store in Portland, Oregon, if they had a captive, they would think say, hey, you know what? We want... Um, vandalism covered coverage if there's a riot and I wouldn't want to be a business owner in today's political climate being in a city where there's riots happening all the time without that type of coverage uh, so cat and captive insurance company policy and language can be personalized to meet the business owner's needs so not policy language that that meets the insurance company's needs, the commercial market's needs, but a policy language that meets the business owner's needs. And that's how forming a captive provides coverage for risks not offered or protects against poor policy language from the commercial market. Yeah, Chris, that's a great, great point. So uh, many of our clients um, who had property insurance in the commercial market, uh, 
that also have a captive uh, have a what we call a broad form property insurance policy. So that's in their captive. And what it does is it picks up things that their commercial property doesn't pick up, things like sinkhole, for example, uh, which can be very real. Uh, but it also included coverage for loss of access to the property if there's no damage. So when governments restricted businesses from, from working, uh, this actually paid the business interruption. So all of our clients who really had a COVID-19 related claim had it paid. Pretty amazing. Just thinking about the importance of that policy language and that a captive can pick up those, those gaps as well. Uh, you mentioned really unique coverages. Uh, one of our most unique coverages that we have seen, and this is just a story to get your, your wheels turning, uh, was we had a large uh, salt miner and their really, their really big risk was a massive conveyor belt that had to move the salt uh, out of the mine so that it could be delivered. But importantly, uh, that if that conveyor belt broke, it wasn't just the time and the cost to fix it, it's the need to keep supplying their customers. And so they did in fact have a loss, very rare, but uh, it happened, the conveyor belt failed. Uh, in the time they took to fix it, they had to buy salt from competitors and then, uh, and then sell that salt to their customers. So there was no, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't drop the ball, right? Uh, and so they ended up losing quite a bit of money, but the captive paid that extra cost. So just think about how powerful that is uh, and how difficult a risk like that would be to insure you know, on a commercial, on commercial paper. All right, very good. So that kind of brings us to, uh, you know, our Q&A time. So really based on 2020 lessons learned and really many lessons from past years, a captive can protect middle market companies from really black swan events uh, and can also help control that commercial insurance cost that's going up in the hard market. Uh, and you know, the reason we're having a hard market is there's so many black swan events. <laughs> so they really go hand in hand. So let's pause here and see what, what questions you all have. Feel free to type them in the chat bar. If you, if you want to, you can certainly uh, unmute and just ask your question. And while we're waiting for questions, if you'd like a copy of the slides we covered today, or you'd like to have a call, just send us a note. Uh, this is Chris's email, my email, and, or you can call. And Randy, another, an additional point on that conveyor belt example that you just stated. And when you said the, the captive paid the claim, it's important to note, the wholly owned captive insurance company paid the claim so the money went from the captive insurance company and it went to the parent company who owned the captive. So again, even though there was a payment, all the money stays in-house within that same organization. Okay, I've got a couple questions here. Let's see. The first is, do we operate in Bermuda, other offshore uh, domiciles? We do off operate in offshore domiciles. We don't currently have captives in Bermuda, but certainly would, uh, if, if someone was interested in a captive and they really wanted it in Bermuda, uh, we'd be happy to, to find a way to make that happen. Uh, do we see captives insuring credit risk? Let me make sure I'm understanding this. Uh, on receivables. Uh, very good question. So we have captives that insure uh, receivables from customers. Uh, and it is, it is definitely possible to insure um, credit risk on receivables. We, we don't have clients that actually do that that I know of today, but uh, it's, you cannot insure uh, what we might call investment risk uh, as an example. Um, but, uh, but certainly the risk of somebody not paying, yes. Uh, normally we tie that to the, uh, the need, they have to go bankrupt though, normally, although um, because arguably until they go bankrupt, you can continue to pursue getting paid. Uh, but yeah, uh, that's a great question. Insuring receivables can be done in a captive. Make sure. Yep. I think I've got all those. And then we've got a couple more questions coming in the chat bar. So let's tackle those. All right. I have been under the impression that captives only begin to pencil out once the client has excess of a million in PNC premium spend, your thoughts. So 
I'm assuming by pencil out, you mean, uh, you know, that make financial sense. Uh, and so, yeah, we're actually seeing captives uh, make sense uh, in some cases at uh, 250 to 500,000 uh, of PNC insurance spend. A lot of that is because we're, we're able to find carriers that are willing to reinsure part of the risk back to the captive. Uh, so, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you a rough number here. Uh, a client paid $500,000 of PNC insurance. Uh, the, the carrier was willing to insure 250 back to their captive. The client is taking a pretty big risk there because the, the carrier is not going to attach till 250. Uh, so, you know, if they have a max claim in the first year, then the, the client uh, captive owner is actually going to lose money that first year, but they're willing to take that risk. Uh, and in the case I'm describing, they've had five years with relatively low losses. Um, total cost to run the captive right at about $40,000. So, you know, 250 minus 40, 210. If their claims are under 210, they're going to come out ahead that year and every year going forward. Uh, the one thing I would say, though, is they did have, an, I do want to make sure you uh, are accounting for collateral. So, you know, one and a half times that 250 or 375 in collateral, uh, it, can, it can be invested conservatively, but, but that is money that's tied up. So there's always a tension between um, how much is, is, um, you know, is insured in the captive because of the collateral requirement. Very often clients will start lower uh, and, and take less risk, lower the collateral, but then as they build up money in the captive, then they're able to take more risk and the collateral requirement isn't as high because the captive's full of money. Um, and Randy, a specific uh, case, I am also currently working on a potential captive and that's what they pay. They pay $250,000 a year to cover core risks we're also talking to them about insuring those non-core risks. And um, we stated the Congress basically incentivizes, like Randy stated earlier, incentivizes business owners to increase their risk mitigation strategies by forming a captive because the premiums are, oh, I'm not a tax expert, but it is tax deductible. And so sometimes we insure those non-core risks. So you can put the 250,000 of the core risk and plus additional non-core risk where all of a sudden it's, uh, there's positive tax consequences to the forming that. Yeah, very good point. Other question we've got here, how do you deal with dispersion of risk requirement in construction? Are there similar types of entities where they don't have many SPEs? So a very good question. And so anytime we discuss a captive insurance uh, you know, company, we've always, we've always got to distribute risk uh, and we've almost always got to reinsure risk, right? So we we don't just form a captive and take all the risk, have a $50 million loss and the business goes under and the captive goes under. There's always some type of, uh, you know, reinsurance, if you will, or risk sharing that has to occur. Um, many of our captives um, are, um, what we do in the structure I described earlier is we basically have a reinsurance company uh, that we run. Um, and it's a, it's a pass-through insurance company that passes the risk out to the captives. So this, this structure really gives the carriers one point of contact uh, for their claims, if you will, one contract, uh, but we're able to spread or achieve distribution among uh, all the other captives in the program. Uh, in some cases, we do have, um, think of it as a co-op, but a, a risk pool arrangement where captives uh, all contract with each other and share risk that achieves distribution if they're not able to do it uh, on their own. Uh, but again, captives are never, um, we never leave them without a backstop, uh, if you will, because it's just, you know, um, unless they're, unless they're um, risks where there's a very finite limit. So uh, we do have trucking companies that ensure physical damage and cargo right in their captive, uh, achieve distribution across the, the scale of their fleet. Uh, but then um, in doing so, they, um, you know, they don't need reinsurance because they kind of know what a you know tractor and trailer cost, or they know, you know, that their max cargo is 200k, for example, and so they know the limit, uh, if you will. Okay. Yeah, IRS requirement for obtaining the proper certification and deductions. Yeah, you know, I, I think you're talking about risk distribution. If if that's the case, um, again, we can do that uh, via pooling with other captives. Uh, or across a statistically significant number of exposure units. So um, 
and and I'll be glad to. I think it's, this is Michael. I'll be glad to jump on a call with you uh, if it helps. So the um, the actuaries are able to do you know calculations on uh, the number of you know exposure units, for lack of a better term. Is it a st statistically significant number of exposure units? If not, um, then um, we normally use a, um, a fronting or reinsurance, you can think of it either way, company that we own to share risk with other, other captives. And by doing that, we're able to achieve distribution. Uh, typically we target at least 50% distribution. Um, the IRS safe harbor is 50. So that help, I hope that's helpful and I'll be glad to talk with you more about it. Okay, other questions? Very good, very good. Well, we really, uh, we're honored that all of you joined us today. Uh, feel free to reach out to Chris or me. We'd be honored to speak with you, set up time with you, help you in any way we can. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for all the questions also. Thank you.